Welcome to the Keen Run Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Yoga podcast is Tyson Yun Kapoorta. Tyson is probably the most inspiring thinker I've come across in recent times. I really mean that. He's part Aboriginal and growing up in a rough outpost of rural Australia, he's led a remarkable life, being rescued in his 20s by his adoptive parents from a war wayward youth, and that's saying it lightly. He's currently a lecturer at Deakin University in Melbourne. Here he discusses the possible positive impact of indigenous viewpoints on established power structures. So after releasing his book, Sand Talk, a fantastic book I recommend two years ago, and this was to great acclaim, he has spoken widely all around the world of the implications of pursuing our trajectory of technological advancement, whilst neglecting the peripheral uh, perspectives that the few remaining indigenous cultures have to offer. Tyson has unique and non-conformative views on almost every subject you can imagine. Having listened to him speak widely on many other people's podcasts, I was keen that he shared some of his ideas with Keen on Yoga. So therefore, what I tried to do here was make this episode a whistle-stop tour through some of his most exciting and possibly transformative thinking. To that end, in this conversation, we first clarify Indigenous thinking, what it is, as opposed to post-colonial liberalism, for example. <laughs> and having tried to narrow down on its differences, then we see how it might be brought to the table to better contextualize our current reductionist theories, modern science, that are decimating the world and each other, and at the same time leaving us feeling more than ever that we're separate and isolated from the land, from ourselves, or from country, as Tyson calls it. And his people believe that we are here to play a custodial role, and so this is what we're talking about in the podcast, and without further ado, we're so pleased to have you here at the Keenan Yoga Podcast. So welcome, Tyson. The Keen on Yoga podcast. It's good to have you. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah, nice to be the, nice to be here in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and where are you coming from? Melbourne, right? Melbourne, Australia, currently. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm staying yeah. in Melbourne. Yeah, right. You now I've been right. here for about three years, four years, I think. Um, right. Yeah, I've got another two or three to go, and then I can uh, move back up north, three and a half thousand kilometers to my own homelands up there, um, Western Cape York. Right. Um, I belong to the Uplitch clan up there. Can't wait to get back. I just went back for a few days, like a couple of weeks ago. And that's that's so all I've time for. <laughs> you're part Aboriginal, and that's your heritage, right? Um, well, fully, yeah, but yeah. I don't know. We don't say that. It's just... <laughs> you don't say <laughs> that? <laughs> you know, well, most of us, you know, um, um, have European descent. You know. Right, right. Just to clarify that. For people that don't yeah. know the clan, the clan that you're talking about is yeah, that kind of fractional blood yeah. quantum thing was kind of right. useful for um, people who were sort of clearing people from the landscape, you know, up until about hundred years ago, and then it it sort of lost its utility. Um, <laughs> right after that, yeah. So no one's inspired me more than you, and I don't think you've ever done yoga. And ostensibly, my podcast is, uh, you know, interviewing people that do yoga. But, uh, yeah. so I don't know whether you've done any yoga, but no one's inspired me more than Tyson recently. He's really invigorated my life, to be honest. And the book, the Sand Talk, fantastic book. And, um, you know, so this is an entry level on, on Tyson's thinking. And really, this guy, he can think around anything, really. And he gives different opinions on, on very familiar issues that we've been used to thinking a certain way about. So that's what really, you know, kind of excites me hearing someone say something different about things like climate change 
economic system, you know, and uh, general kind of current thinking on, on any topic. So, you know, can you just start with just a little overview of what your idea of indigenous thinking is in the book and why, why we might need it now and what, why it might be helpful? Yeah, well, I should give you a little bit on my yoga, my yoga background. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Have you done some yoga? Have you? Which is like, well, well, not really. Like, but I I know lots of people who do it, and they're like, "Oh, here, try this, try this." Um, You know, so like years ago, before I moved to the city, like I moved to the city three or four years ago, but before that, you know, um, my lifestyle was very different, and you basically, you know, I spent most of my life on the ground. You know, like sitting you know, living, et cetera, eating, et cetera, just on the floor or on the ground. That's that's the whole thing. And you kind of get everything you need that way. Um, so people were like, ah, oh, here, try this. You know, it's only your first time. But but I, I could do uh, all the stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm not like, you know, yogi stuff. I'm not like, you know, I couldn't tie myself into a pretzel or anything. But, you know, I could do a lot of the basic stuff pretty easy that they yeah. reckon, oh, you you got to work for a year before you can do that. And right, that's just right, from right. living on the ground. So my theory about yoga is that it's like um, it's a, a scientific system, uh, like a medical, you know, intervention sort of system for um, uh, to maintain people's longevity and energy and you know physical systems, you know, after transitioning from you know a, a land based lifestyle to a civilization, because those civilizations are pretty old there in India, you know. Pretty damn old. There's some around nine thousand years old, etc. Okay, around there. right. Yeah. The so I, thing, I, yeah. I, I, I just, yeah, I just got this idea. Yeah, I got this idea that 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 was invented to, um, you know, by the sort of clever people of that culture uh, to figure out how to offset a lot of the um, uh, the diseases and you know, um, you know, terrible physical sort of conditions that, that always begin happening. You know, with a sedentary lifestyle in a civilization, in a built environment, and um, yeah, where you're no longer sort of uh, you know in migratory seasonal cycles, and yeah, you know, having uh, to get your water on the, on the ground, it. yeah, yeah, you're sleeping up on beds, you're you're sitting on chairs and sofas, and you know, and plus, you know, I know, I guess you get bored with um, like the same three sex positions over and over, and you and you want to mix things up a little. And there's just some things that you can't do without a bit of stretching first. So <laughs> <laughs> that's more like it. Um, so what about? I mean, the only, probably the only thing actually. Let's let's get right in there. That I don't agree with what you've said um, is that people can only know themselves through context. And though I, I know I agree to a degree about that, the idea of the yoga, or at least currently what's coming through, is self knowledge, right? Like knowing oneself outside of relationship. And I, I know you've said that a couple of times I've heard, and I'm you know, not completely with you in the idea that you only know yourself within relationship. Is there nothing that you can know outside of relationship to another person? Oh, you can't even to be. A, to, to, no, to a how can you even exist? Right, right. How, how can you even exist outside of relation? Right. Now, that's the only way you there's nothing, actually there's nothing exist. There, nothing there. Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, there's no such thing as a vacuum. Right. So no matter how individual or solitary you believe yourself to be or in solitude or whatever at any moment you're not, you're, you're profoundly connected, you know, uh, to other people, but also, you know, other entities, you know, in the landscape around you. Uh, and these would be human, non-human, um, living, non-living, you know, inanimate sort of objects that are also sentient and full of information and, knowledge and life, you're connected to these things in some way. And it might be a weak connection. It might be a connection you're not consciously aware of, but you're connected all the time. And you're not connected as this brilliant individual, like immediately and un- uh, unmediated straight out to the cosmos, to some distant stars. You know, that's that's not um, that's not how your connection happens. You're of this place. You're of this place where you stand, you know, where you are, your spirit comes out of the ground here. And, you know, your mind is in a web of relationships coming right out through your reality. You know, what some people call ontolo- your ontology. Yeah. You know, and everything has an ontology. Everything has its own unique uh, informatics, you know. So a rock has its own ontology. You know, so it's in relation to, you know, the people who are familiar with it. It's in relation to, 
you know, if it's on top of the ground and understands the sky, maybe it actually came from the sky. Um, you know, at some stage it bloody did. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's you know it's part of the you know in its ontological universe. You've got the wombat that likes to take a shit on top of that rock. You've got you know all kinds of stuff, and you've got all the information that holds all the atoms of that rock together, so that it doesn't just collapse into nothingness. You know, and it's part of a story. It's part of a sentient landscape. It is uh, uh, throwing out phosphorus uh, to nourish the trees, so it's in relation to those trees. So it's in this complex web of relationship, like the simplest, you know, being, simplest entity of a rock. It, it's in that. It has its own auto um, ontology. So that rock is unique in the universe, and it's not unique somehow inside of itself. It has a unique set of a web of relations that is not replicated any anywhere else in the entire cosmos. Only that rock is patterned on that particular place and set of relations in that way. Same goes for you. All of your your mind, yourself, all the things that you think are arising out of some fabulous being that inhabits, you know, your meat suit. Um, that's that's not it. You you aren't that. You're the nexus of a web of relationships and. Um, you know, a pretty sacred sort of a species. Kind of begs the question, though, doesn't it? Because obviously, we, we, you know, like you're saying, we are connected and we can't help but be connected. But yeah, mm. we don't feel it. We don't feel that way. We feel we've lost that connection. Um, yeah. And that's a lot. Of, and that is a lot of what you're thinking. I think, you know, I was trying to get clear of exactly what your the, the kind yeah. of nub of your thinking is. And a lot of your thinking is going back to connection. But how, I mean, like, you don't often talk about practically how you can do that. I mean, you're in Melbourne now. You say you hate it there. It's a concrete swamp. I've heard you say many times. Um, well, yeah, and I know it's making me sick. And here's how I verify. Here's how I, I, I can attempt to falsify my 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 hypothesis that Mel, that the city life and sedentary lifestyle is making me sick. All right. So I try my second ever yoga <laughs> because my my spouse, who I moved to Melbourne for. I moved here for love, you know, most beautiful, you know, Aboriginal woman you could ever imagine in your life. Just, mm, just so in love still. Um, hopefully I, I don't become, turn into a walrus too much before we leave Melbourne and she can remain remotely attracted to me. That would be awesome. But yeah, she's well into yoga. Um, right. and so much that she's like injured herself several times doing it because she just re gets really enthusiastic. And yeah. anyway, so she, she was like, oh, you got to try this here. Try these poses. And I said, yeah, yeah, I've done that before. Wasn't really keen on it. She's like, oh, I try and do this. And, and all of a sudden I find out, I don't even been here a couple of years. All of a sudden I couldn't even touch my toes. I'm like, holy shit, what happened to my flexibility? It's all gone because I'm not sitting on the floor anymore. I'm not, um, you know, stretching myself around and inhabiting a real landscape. I'm in these tiny boxes and sitting on these poxy chairs for 12 hours a day. And, you know, it's no good. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not sleeping on the ground anymore. I'm in these soft beds and bloody blah, blah. And it's it's no good. You know, I, I, my body's wrecked. So anyway, yoga was my variable. Yoga was the test that I ran to 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 prove to myself, to like check, to verify whether or not the city was making me sick. <laughs> so first, you know, that, yeah. trial control group, no city. <laughs> yeah. Could could do all the stretches, and then two years later, city life. Try it again. Couldn't it cut, touch my toes? Can barely see my toes, brother. <laughs> this belly coming out now. I'm, I'm just turning into this horrendous, horrendous sort of uh, a, 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 an elephantine figure. Yeah. Luck, luckily, you can still think. Yeah, and we should do some hot yoga or something. Right. <laughs> Well, what, so, I mean, I, I think this is the question, isn't it? Like, you've got you've got some fantastic ideas, but practically speaking, how do we get back from country to country? Where you you mentioned the earth, the land, the connection to that as country in your books a lot, you know. And I like the expression, and I think it's wonderful. But how the hell do people get back to this if they have to be in a city like you? Even you have to be in the city, and many people, you know, they don't have a choice, you know. Um, well, many people, many, or in England, there's not many places that aren't cities now. <laughs> there's not much country left. So how you know? So what do we do with this thinking? You know, like this this reconnecting to the rocks, the spirit. To you know, I mean, you have this. I remember when I was 11 years old. Um, the first time that I 
a herd of Aboriginal thinking and I was really taken with song lines. They came to do a, a thing in the schools mm. and as you, I think you did when you were young, it was probably a very cliched thing where, you know, the Aborigines yeah. presented in this way, you know, but the song lines touched me. The idea of land having, mm. having meaning and, and, you know, and rhythm and context within itself, that, yeah. that you know, that, that fascinated me. But, you know, like, I went away. I mean, you know, I didn't get to see any of that because I was living in, you know, in concrete. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, so you have to have these uh, kind of physio-psycho technologies you know, um, these like the like a yoga system. I mean, you have to have that in order just to um, just to sort of offset the damage of, of living in a, a sort of a placeless, you know, urban landscape. Um, you know, and, and the the illnesses that come from that, the sickness that comes from it. Um, yeah, you have to have that. So you know, and and a lot of it is necessarily inwards looking. Because in order for the city to function, it runs on individuals. It needs individuals. And it needs individuals because it needs a caste system. And you understand that because you're a geezer. You come from, uh, <laughs> you come from an entire class of people that's, um, that's been relegated to the underclasses of your country for forever. <laughs> you know, I know this because they sent a bunch of you over, uh, over here as slaves. <laughs> Yeah. He married in, married into our families. I'm probably part, part geezer myself, you know. And uh, the Australian accent is basically a combination. It's a combination of Cockney and um, Aboriginal English, so I feel very, very comfortable with geezers. So you know what it is to be, uh, you know, relegated to a certain position within a caste system. And, and when they develop the rights of man, I know this feels like it's gone off on a tangent, but it all comes back together. <laughs> when they developed the... Um, uh, human rights, the first human rights framework, what gives, you know, what gave rise to our human rights understanding today and, and all of those yeah. mechanisms. And it was after the French Revolution, they're trying to decide on the rights of man. And of course, as always happens, up comes the Jewish question. You know, and this always happens, you know, like the Cockney question, the, <laughs> the Aboriginal question. It's like insert ethnicity that you wish to relegate to the bottom of the pile. Um, it's a question of what are we going to do about the the Jewish problem. So th this particular Jewish question was um, um, can Jews have human rights? Like are they even human? Can they have human right. rights? And where they ended up was in a very liberal position for the time, which is yes, Jews can have – uh, they can have human rights but only as individuals. The right. Jewish community – a Jewish community cannot have human rights, but an individual who wants to be socially mobile and a group is display a certain degree of assimilation, uh, that individual can be. And so it's the same everywhere. You know, individual as like you're incentivized is a system of perverse incentives that uh, drives everyone in a civilization towards being individuals. And you must be an individual. You must be an individual or the growth-based system that the civilization is based on cannot function and the civilization will fail, you know. Um, and a lot of them fail after a while, you know, because there's still close kin systems, you know, particularly in places like India where, you you know, you marry into second, third, fourth, fifth cousins, you know, and you keep these sort of uh, these dense kin-based networks together. No civilization is going to survive that. You can't do that if a, an entire family or a clan can communally hold property. <laughs> you can only do it if you break people up into individuals. So, you know, also you need religions, you know, where people have a, a personal relationship with God that is theirs and theirs alone, mediated by a, an authority figure. You know, you need to have a whole heap of things. You need to have um, um, physio, um, uh, psychotechnological systems such as yoga, whereby people are encouraged to look inwards and see themselves as this fabulous individual with all the answers inside of them. Um, well, that's the funny <laughs> thing, isn't it? Because we, we're told that you know, the apex of society is to become an individual, right? That, you know, yeah, individuation is, that, is the oh, whole, you, you know, the holy grail of what, what, we're, yeah, what we're aiming for. Yeah. You self-actualize to the top of what? Yeah. Pyr pyramid, bros. Pyramid. Mm, mm. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. You know, <laughs> you know, in all the early civilizations built pyramids. You know, because that's that's the structure of what is that's the shape a civilization needs to take. Um, 
you know, so you have to have a caste system because without a caste system, then you nothing could be priced because you can't price an item unless it's both limitable and excludable. So you have to have a limited amount of it and you need to be able to exclude 50% of the population from access to it. And you need to make sure there's more demand than supply, otherwise economic growth can't happen. Uh, so these civilizational systems, whether they're communist or capitalist, you know, same bloody thing. Communism just burns burns up a whole heap of people's lives a bit quicker if you want to um, it, it, like accelerate your industrialization. That's about the only difference. Um, you know, both are two sides of the same coin. So yeah, in order to have that rampant growth, you need people as individuals. Uh, you also need them to be uniform, though, which is a, a bit of a paradox. You need millions mm. of people, mm. you know, who are alike in thought, word, and deed, but believe themselves to be fabulous mm. individuals. So you and I have grown up with decades of a, a film and TV, yeah. a TV tradition where we believe ourselves to be these fantastic rebels. And yeah. I'm like, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm being all like rough as guts and saying fuck on podcasts and stuff. Yeah. Well, I, and I think I'm being this 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 rebel. Right, yeah. I'm not. I, I'm conforming to exactly the blueprint that's been installed on me through my television set from when I was a kid, even with two channels. <laughs> you know, that's how it works. Um, yes, yeah, so you have to be this fabulous individual. And then, you know, you have to self-actualize and stop watching the movies and start going to a passionate retreat and, uh, you know, um, focus on an awareness, an awareness of your breath. Yeah, Become aware yeah. of your breath. Yeah. You know, um, stuff your breath. Look, you, you need to be aware of your place. You need uh, is the thing you need to focus on. You need to come into an awareness of time and place. So, in the place where you are, you've got you've got an economic, you've got the idea that an economic system is always going to trap, constrain, and kind of squeeze the life out of people in the you know, yeah. right. I mean, but um, we, and you also yeah. so you also say there's no way you can exist and provide for for yourself, let alone if you want to marry, have kids. If you don't constrain yourself to the mindset of the economic system. Oh yeah, you're homeless. It's like don't beat yourself up about it. Everybody feeling guilty about their their privilege or their bloody position or anything else is looking like, onto that, bros. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's just it. Anybody so what's the op- would. What's the option? What's you know? the other option? Exactly. What's your other option? Yeah. Yeah. What else are you going to do? You know, you're not going to die. You're not going to let your kids die. I mean, you know, what are you going to flagellate yourself in the middle of the town square and then go home and count your gold? There's no point even doing that. Like, just just chill um, and start becoming aware of your network of relations. So the first thing you need to do is connect with your place, and, you know, and you need to connect with these two variables. Um, yeah, so time and place together. Until you understand that that's one thing. So you become aware, uh, you have to become aware of the seasonal cycles. And it's not four seasons, that's an economic construct. You know, there's usually more like seven or eight seasons or sometimes six in a place. So you look for that. And it'll be marked by signs, by signals. So, you know, um, and you might have to drive for a bit (laughs) to get it in your Ah, uh, sort of bioregion or what's left of it, but there yeah. are still badges there, man. Like I've been there, I've been there, and I, I've done the walks. You know, Brits are mad for those bloody walking trails and stuff, and what a perfect way to do it. So you need to know when the daffodils flower, and you know what time of year that happens for, and for how long. When the and and start to notice I, I've, for years of observation, you know when the winds come in from that, which direction they come from. Um, when does that viper come out? You still got vipers there. I know you do. I've seen them. You got uh, badges. A viper. Got We've got adders. We've got um, some adder, like, not that adder, viper. Yeah, 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 the adder. Yeah, yeah. yeah viper. Adder. viper is more like off. Mediterranean, isn't it? No, it's the adder. Yeah, sorry. Man. It's an adder. Yeah. yeah, they sound like they both look the same to me anyway. So what time they come out? You know, when do they come out? And um, and what are they doing? And what are they after? And when is their like peak fat season? You know, because when they come out from Cold time, they're skinny as and sick as hell, you know. But when do they get to peak fat? When are they mating? Um, when are the badgers mating? When are they on the move? When are um, you know hedgehogs doing their thing? What is the thing that hedgehogs do? All this kind of shit that drove. Um, oh, who's that uh, Dutch painter? Um, 
What's his name again? That uh, <laughs> <laughs> that one who cut off his ear and sent it to his oh, girlfriend. Oh, Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Yes. Yeah. Van Van yeah. Gogh. I think uh, you Van Gogh. Um, yeah. Yeah. He drove himself mad looking for seasonal, you know, an understanding of uh, eternity through the seasons. But he was only looking at that economic cycle of four seasons, which is based on what can be harvested. You know, the labor of peasants. You know, divided into four blocks of time. Um, based on what could be extracted at different times of the year. Um, that's it. You know, and he drove himself nuts there and had to blow his brains out in the end. But he was looking at the wrong things. I'm looking at everything he's painting. He's painting agriculture. It's, Bros, there's a hedge there. Go and look in the freaking hedge. You'll find a porcupine quill there. You'll find some tracks. Follow those porcupine tracks. Have a look at porcupine. Go and have a look and see what's going on down that way. Go down to the creek. You know, hopefully that all the American uh, crayfish haven't eaten all the, all the British cray, the British indigenous crayfish yet. You know, have a look and see what they're doing. You know, <laughs> why aren't people doing yeah. this? Why aren't they? Why aren't they? Yeah. And one thing, that, one thing I realise in reading your book, I mean, you've got this great chapter where you're talking about the relation of the termite mound and mm. and the bird, right? It's like some kind of parrot, and it, like a, and it, 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 yeah, and it shits in the termites and that, right? I mean, can you? Um, the, the complexity of nature is just formidable, but for some reason people have lost touch or they don't care anymore. Or, That's what, it. What is, what is it? Well, it's those symbioses, you know, because then you start to see how they're interrelated. You start to see that adder, that badger, that, you know, willow tree, that you start to see these in a symbiotic relation and almost in a totemic group, you know, where you can start to, um, you know, come into a feeling of spirit and relation with that, to- with that uh, symbiotic group you know, almost as a totemic relation, as a proto-totemic relation, you start to come back into a knowing of the land and of place no matter where you are. And you're not going to end up on your ancestral homeland because who who has only one line of ancestry in the Mm. freaking world now? Almost nobody. Mm. Who is living on their traditional homeland? Who? Mm. You know, most people are dispossessed. Most people are, um, you know, um, most people are a part of a diaspora, you know, and that's it. Maybe not your people. You're probably pretty close to where you always were, but, <laughs> but I think that's how uh, they maintain their regional accents so well in the UK. All the time. <laughs> well, it's a small place. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny. It's like uh, it's like I've noticed that Britain and Italy they have that same dynamic, where you, no matter what you do, you can't kill the regional identities in hmm. that place because right. it's like um, it's like the bioregion, the landscape, the those borders. Of that place and that originating culture, like I'm talking even pre-Celtic, you know, I get this sense that there's this line that just comes right through and you can't deny it and that the land is so sacred and so powerful in those places that it affects everybody, whether they're aware of it or not, like right down to your accent, because how the hell in such a tiny place, you've got so many accents that are still maintained, no matter what the cultural influences are from around the planet. You can get anybody there. You can get like, you know, somebody from Sri Lanka could land there and he's going to be a geezer in like 10 minutes. You know, that <laughs> the land will shape your, um, the land shapes your word, your speech. It shapes your culture. It shapes the unique culture of your people. It, it shapes the way you do trade, the patterns you follow for governance. It starts to shape all of these things, you know, and you just can't get away from that. You can't get away from that. I think people have been kind of kind of led to believe that that you know that they that are that their systems or the civilizations uh, you know make the make our make us up rather than the land right there there's, there seems to be a strong yeah. lobby to to materialize the the human mind and body right like you've got this mm. bit in uh, I heard you speak maybe it's not in the book about the about this crazy kind of thing about the crocodiles and the aboriginal ceremony of tying the baby's hair around the crocodile right and then and then they, they have us bond with the crocodile for life. And then they go yeah. into the river and they can call their crocodile. And it, you yeah. know, and it will take care of them and it will help them fish and things like that. Yeah. That, to, to the, to the, we, got photos. Like, we got photos, photos of my clan in the 1950s still doing that. A river full of men, each one holding up the tail yeah, of the Yeah, holding the crocodile. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this kind of magic of nature, it seems like there's a lobby to, to, to kind of make, make us think that it doesn't exist. Right? There's nothing yeah. magical in existence, right? Um, or it's inimical to us. There's predators out there that want to eat you. 
that you couldn't possibly be in relation to, like with those crocodiles. So it's all about fight or flight. And then that gives rise to the sort of game theory side uh, kind of uh, picture of the world where it's every man for himself, fight or flight, survival of the fittest, individualizes us again, gets us in this rivalrous dynamic, this competitive dynamic, and and you kind of have to because if you don't, you will die. So it creates this, it makes it makes the survival of the fittest myth. It makes it real by you know imposing these layers of abstraction through economy and labor and everything else. You know, All right. ah, stuff that. I'm sick and, of it. <laughs> All right. So is there, I mean, going back to the thing that you kind of fancy talking about, we said at the start, is there an original then? Is there something which is, you know, is there an original, is there an original person that is in context, you know, right? In context with one another and the land, right? Can we, can we go back to uh, the eating, <laughs> eating, eating paleo and, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, plowing you, off you, fields you with are. horses? Yeah. You are the original person, and so am I. We're we're still the same species, right? And everything, you know, in the same way that you migratory r- roots are like encoded into the the cellular memory of elephants and geese and everything else. Like they know where to go as soon as they're born, you know. In the same way, we have that. We're patterned as a custodial species who knows how to do that connection. In fact, that's all we can do. And the second you remove um, the state and the marketplace, like, like the economy, uh, in, say, for example, a disaster, and you suddenly see the patterns of behavior coming through about right. what what people really are. You see people banding together in groups, you know, and, and it's seldom it. just, it's seldom it. just they, chaos. Yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. happy. I mean, my like nan, they're, 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 yeah, my nan was happy during the war. struggling for she survival loved, she loved and loving she loved it. Being... Oh, the powdered egg. Yeah, yeah. She probably yeah, still... They're... Like yeah. looking for powdered egg now. <laughs> <laughs> no, rationing, ra- rationing. Yeah, they love the. They get one banana only. Only be able to get one banana a week, and yeah, yeah. that's it. You go out the back, uh, milk the milk the pigs. Uh, yeah, you know the pigs. <laughs> I'm just making that's that up. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And every now and then, like once a year for a special treat, you get some lamb's fry or some suet or something like that from the butcher, and he give you a little wink, and I don't know, maybe you flash him a that's bit it. of thigh or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> get hold of that and you get home and everybody, you know, has one teaspoonful of that and happy as, happy as hell. <laughs> I mean, like people listening should, I mean, are you, oftentimes it seems you're suggesting to go back in context with the land. Is that the mm. suggestion to try and get back to sitting on, sitting well, on, on the land and be all, yeah. you know. It's a, it's a cognition and you don't have to travel. You might think that you've got to go to, um, you know, the Amazon or something and, you know, live amongst the trees and, and get some ayahuasca up you. Yeah. It's like, nah, you don't need that. You know, it's right there. So even though, you know, even in the middle of Melbourne, I, I do s- see when the trees flower, you know, even if they're foreign trees that are like behaving like weeds here. And, you know, I, I, I come to understand where all the underground water is. I come to understand what the seasons are like and what happens and how I can expect to feel. And uh, what kind of foods you get in the supermarket at different times of the year, um, everything is kind of in this big symbiotic relation, you know. And, and you just come into an awareness of that until time and place are one thing. And when that happens, then you know you begin to understand the web of relations that you're in, and you're constantly seeking to strengthen those relationships. And that's not through like spending quality time with your teenage son or something like that. That's not. You know, a good relationship is not like, oh, let's go to the movies together or something like that. Right. You know, it's about it's about genuinely beginning to blur the self other boundary between you and the 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 beings that you're in relation to all around you, and that that can be both human and non human. You know, people all around you. You know, uh, what you might think of as animate and inanimate. You know, yeah. you start to understand yourself in relation to all these things. And you start to understand how you know how all of your best knowledge sits in the relational space between those things. And you make it your job to beautify that relational space between you. You complexify it. You keep adding to it. You um the things that you want to remember, you add them in there. You add them into your place and the desire lines of your travel through your place. 
Uh, you come to have story for the place where you're walking. You know, you have stories. Um, there's all the time neuroscience will tell you the entire time, you know, we exist as human beings to make story. You know, there's, there's a narrator in your neurology that is constantly arranging all of the data that's coming in through your senses into a story of your life. It's got yeah. everything but a soundtrack, yeah. you know, <laughs> and you can make a soundtrack too. So, you know, it's just the things that you think are quotidian and, you know, somehow dirty and being attached to this flesh or to this dirt beneath your feet. That's the sacred right there. And that's where, that's where you make the connection. It's like, and uh, and it's amazing how um, how 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 well your breathing how well your breathing imp- improves when you are in that. You know, you don't have to start out with an awareness of your breathing. You start out with awareness of your place and relations, and that that starts to uh, you know put you into a good spot with your physiology. You know, not that I can talk. Like I'm, I don't know. Look at me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm like 10 kilos overweight and sick as a dog. And don't listen to me. I don't know what the hell get I'm talking about. Get a bit of yoga. About. Yeah, yeah, get some yoga up here. That's what my, my spouse keeps saying that. And I'm like, oh, what am I, a middle-aged, middle-class white lady? I'm not going to do yoga. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what, what it means what? over here now. It's yeah. not, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I you don't. haven't got but- like a brown guy with a dot on his forehead teaching yeah. me here. It's like. You know, it's Cheryl from <laughs> <laughs> it's Cheryl from Bow Desert. You know, yeah, we're gonna do some mat fucking yoga today. Come on, roll out your mats, <laughs> and um, off we go. You can really hear that Cockney coming through the Aussie accent there. Right? <laughs> no, that's, that's good. Mm-hmm. Well, but there's so many ways I can go with, with, with what you're saying. But one idea that's coming over is people love the idea of diet, right? And they're obsessed with, yeah, yeah. Get, you know, like, right, and you said something about the salmon. I thought it was brilliant. Like, uh, you know, he said, well, I eat fish, you know, it's got the right oils. It's got the right protein. I just take capsules. If I take uh, the fish oils every day, that'll sort me out. Right. And, yeah. you know, you had a slightly more complex take on, you know, the idea of fish oil and taking it from the right time and the right season, the yeah. right fat, you know, yeah, just say something about that, would you? Well, I know, I, I, you know, I know our medicine knowledge. Like people th- always think it's plant and herb law, you know, indigenous knowledge, um, indigenous medicine, but it's not. It's also animals and minerals and everything else. But um, yeah, so you know, the fat from an animal in its peak fat season, and that can last for about two months. In that peak fat season, it is medicinal. Different animals have different, you know. So a fruit bat, for example. The fat from that in its peak fat season is good for uh, respiratory disorders. You know, from an eel, that's good for fever, the peak fat. Um, from salmon, salmon, that's um, good for your kidneys. It can completely, if you've got necrosis in your kidneys, it can reverse that. And we know that. And you know the time. And it's, it's kind of slightly different every year. So you can't just go, you know. Oh, on the thirty fifth, no, the th- the thirty first of such and such until the second of such and such, then that's the that's the salmon is medicinal. It's like nah, you got to know in a particular place. Okay, in this place, when you see the yellow flowers on these trees, that's when the salmon's medicinal, and you harvest it. See about place and time again, being one thing. Right in that in that mm. place time, you harvest those salmon, and you harvest that fat. And it is medicine, you know. And so, uh, so I did all the research of reading through all of the fish oil trials, you know, because they did a lot of trials, and but they could never replicate the results because in one trial it would completely miraculously heal the kidneys, and in the next trial it would go the other way and damage them. And it's like, well, we can't replicate the results, so that's why we have to put a big warning label on the fish oil capsules that you buy at the shops, you know. Warning, there's absolutely no evidence that this does anything for you at all. You know what I mean? Because they just assume that fish oil is a substance, a universal substance with universal properties, you know. And so, you know, that's how that works. But it's the same as, let's talk about willow bark in a minute too. (laughs) i got to be in my Talk about about it. But, I mean, I just want to point out that that is, if people are trying to get their head around what indigenous thinking is, is thinking within that that kind of perspective and context, right? Not just extricating one part of reality. Go well. No, we we reduce everything to that. 
you know, that that's what fixes it rather than thinking, okay, there's a lot of context and variables, variables around here to bring in to the whole picture. And it, would that yeah, be, a, you know, a reasonable, you know, foray into this kind of thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? And, you know, right. you start to build a, a very complex map of all the symbioses that exist in your reality, you know. And once you see that, then you start to see the things that disrupt them as well. You know, you start to see the uh, the monopolies and the cheats and the, you know, the things that an economic system uh, is constantly, you know, disrupting. A, a, a market that claims that it's a free market, but it's not. It's incredibly horrendously stacked and loaded and you know subsidized and you know um weighted <laughs> what, you know what, a system of what about this idea? these kind of things <laughs> are imposed <laughs> to disrupt cycles <laughs> but you notice them and then you notice more of the the sort of superstructure around you that's enforcing the caste systems and you start to understand ah oh, okay you know you start to understand your identity as being of place and it's like well in a society where everybody's turned into individuals then everybody's given different sort of tribes that don't actually mean anything, you know, where people are on the ground socially fragmented, but the people in your tribe are spread out all over the place and they belong to, you know, this ethnic category or this gender or this sexuality or this political persuasion, et cetera, so that you're all kind of scattered and fragmented and you're placed into these arbitrary groupings which are nothing but just your demographic profile that's only relevant to the powerful, you know, but all of a sudden that's supposed to represent your unique, amazing, you know, fingerprint uh, as a human being. Well, it doesn't, you know. you got to let that stuff go and understand what species you belong to and that you're a species in a habitat and that habitat is your place where you are and that place is your bioregion. Come to know it. Come to understand the time, place and your relationships within that and, um, and, and you'll be human again. And it so is good it, to feel human again. <laughs> well, we hope so. We're, we're in, we're in, we're, within civilization, is there any possibility of having, a, a, you know, a positive outcome or, or even a positive economic system? Is there any system that, that, that isn't going to enslave people within a civilization or is it always going to be that exploitative? Oh, no, it's, uh, well, know, it's, it's been uh, very temporary, isn't it? Right. The experiment of, of, of civilizations, which basically it's just a, you know, any community that's going to rely on importation of resources and uh, constant growth, otherwise it collapses. That, that's all a civilization is. You know? It's not arts, culture, rule of law, grinding flour for bread and all that bullshit. That's every culture does that anyway. <laughs> that's not the definition mm. of civilization. Mm. But, yeah, all these ones, they, they last, you know, 500 years, max 1,000 years. Civilizations because there's there's a law of the land, um, and if you don't believe in the law of the land as being an intrinsic, you know, property in the landscape, then understand it as the laws of physics. That's the first law of thermodynamics, the first law of the first people. You can't take more than what there is. <laughs> you know, um, you know, nothing's created and destroyed. It's just you know, uh, kind of. Mm. in these closed loops within and across systems. If you break that and you try and make little entropic second law sort of vacuums and enclosures, you know, where you limit that exchange of energy and, and strangle everything off and, and take more than what there is until it's all dead, then, yeah, you end up with landscapes that look like where, I mean, the first civilizations, it's no accident that they're in the deserts now. They weren't right. deserts before. <laughs> so it's a, like a desert-making culture, you know. Um, but, you know, the entire Middle East is a culture that until like half a century ago when it was disrupted was something that was in a state of, um, a state of transition, you know, into, in, in, in back to place and sustainability, you know, after, because, I mean, they did civilization, you know, better than anyone. And it's, uh, it ravaged their landscape. But, you know, most of the Middle East was transitioning back to pastoralism and everything else. They still kept a lot of the amazing knowledge from their Enlightenment period. And, you know, it still had this genius and everybody's multilingual and, and, and just doing like incredible maths and all kinds of stuff yeah. around the place. But, you know, um, they had shepherds and goat herds and stuff again. They're, they're having pastoral existences and in, 
you know, and gradually, you know, over a thousand year period, they'd have built up their, their topsoils and their microclimates and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, the Bedouin culture, by the time the Bible was written, the Bedouin culture, which, um, you know, also the, the Jews, like before they got, um, before that bit of climate change happened and they got pulled into, um, into Egypt as slaves, they lived pretty much the same way as a pastoral, a mobile pastoral community on seasonal estates. Um, but yeah, they had a way of reclaiming that desert and those ravaged lands in the Fertile Crescent. You know, they, they had uh, practices for doing that where they'd find, you know, a sage bush in the middle of the desert. That indicates there's some moisture there. And so they'd leave a lamb there and that lamb would eat the sage bush and then, you know, uh, with its manure, you know, et cetera, it would multiply the sage bush. So they come back next season. And, you know, there's five sage bushes there. So they leave another lamb with that one. And then those two have babies. And after about 50 years, um, there's an oasis there, you know. And that's that uh, in the Lord's, in that prayer that, uh, you know, he maketh me lay down in green pastures. Because uh, that's how they did it. They'd break the lamb's leg uh, to make it lay down. And so it didn't just run off into the desert and die. That's how they abandoned that uh, one there. So they had ways of oasis making and reclaiming desert. And eventually they would have um But that's always going to be small collectors of people, It's just right? the, discovery be- of, um, the discovery of fossil fuels kind of it really disrupted that process of a, of, a, of a return. And they were doing it. They were doing it really well. And I think it was a really good model of it, you know, the way they were living. Yeah. I was just like, but that was small amounts of people. Doing, I mean, can you do it, you know, in a collective, in a great collective like we're currently seeing? Or is that? Yeah, yeah. You can. Well, you know, India's a really good, I mean, you know, so back in the day before all the dudes showed up with their pith helmets, like, hello, um, you know, and muskets and such, you know, the, all these ruins of all these civilizations that they just gone, oh, forget about that, that's killing everything. And then, you know, mm. they were doing really well. Like, the, if you look at the, like, indigenous knowledge, of a lot of the women who are keeping the native seed banks um, now, like uh, you, you check out Vandana Shiva's work on all that sort of stuff. You know, I mean, that's um, that's some that's some solid indigenous knowledge, and they, you know, they still have it. They still had it. You know, they managed to put the brakes on their civilization building. You know, in time to um, you know make sure they they could sustain their continent with a hell of a lot of people on it, um, but in luscious abundance, they were doing really well. Um, yeah, <laughs> but there's just, I mean, you know, they have a growth based economic system now and they're claiming that they're decolonized, but no, <laughs> they're not decolonized. You know, a British administration is no longer on the ground spending lots of money to um, try and keep them in control, but they don't need to because they have, uh, you know, a system of a foreign system of corporate control that's, um, you know, completely sucking their continent dry. Not that it's a continent, but you know what I mean. Mm. Um, Looks like a continent to me. When I was a kid, I'm like, you know, eh, <laughs> how come you, you're calling Europe a continent, but India's not? How come <laughs> Greenland isn't a continent? Greenland's bigger than Australia on this map. What's going on? Oh, I see. There's the equator, like, through, you know, two thirds of the way. You've stretched the map to make yourselves look bigger up in Europe. They're, All right, I got you. Uh, Greenland's actually tiny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. On, along those lines, what are your thoughts on climate change? You say some. It's like a little, there's a little yep. kind of whistle stop tour through some of Tyson's thoughts. Uh, well, yeah. let's let's just go with a health metaphor because we're into health tonight. Um, well, if if you've got candida, like really, um, you know, horrendous, catastrophic, systemic candida, candidal infection, and I don't know if you've ever had that. I'm watching your eyes to see if there's painful memories of that coming through. Um, if you've got candida. Um, climate change, global warming is the rash. So that's not what's going on in your belly or in your mouth or in your blood with the whole candida thing. It's just the rash. Now you can put ointment on that rash to relieve the itching as much as possible or to clear up the rash, but you still got candida and she's going to pop up somewhere else. So, um, yeah, look, it's, it's part of a, um, you know, that particular crisis is part of a larger ecological meta crisis, you know, which involves, um, you know, the loss of about 60% of the biodiversity on the planet, you know, um, all kinds of things like massive, 
um, or almost like runaway effects now because you have these positive feedback loops, you know, um, going on. And a lot of interventions, systemic interventions that people think are going to help actually hurt. So my favorite example is, um, is people, let's go back to the desert. You know, uh, people are proposing that you, you cover the Sahara desert because it's useless land. You cover it with solar panels. Boom. You power the lot. Um, the only problem with that is that if you covered even 25%, then all of a sudden there's, there's a change there, you know, with the reflected heat off the sand and you've made a microclimate across that region. Um, and you've increased rainfall and all of a sudden you've changed that system. And wow, well, that's okay. Then the desert will, uh, you know, bloom again. The only problem with that is that would kill the Amazon because the Amazon relies on the nutrients from the dust storms in the Sahara. You know, it's the dust storms in the Sahara that supply the nutrients for the Amazon. So the Amazon would die out if you didn't have desert there. So it's like the butterfly effect of anything you do is going to interfere with something else. And, and we've got people, you know, considering firing missiles into the sky to put a layer of dust to block out the sun and stuff like that. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is one this step on from weather alteration. Yeah, well, it's, it, we're just really lucky that it was more of a priority to send some billionaires up there first. <laughs> yeah. What? What can people do then? I mean, I I love your thinking because it's kind of a bit like mine. You know, you, you don't really give answers, but you, you raise a lot of problems. Um, you know, like you say, well, you know, it's no good like saying, you know, you're going to not go to Starbucks and, you know, avoid yeah. Amazon or, you know, even recycle. I mean, what, you know, like the, mm. the choices that people make as consumers matter or not? Yeah. Look, you need to divest yourself of this illusion that power is anything to do with you or anything that you will ever be able to have any influence over, because you, you won't. Well, you were, say, you were saying that there's, you're, telling, you're telling me there's no democracy. You... Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you don't influence. So who do you think? I don't know. You look at that um, sock puppet you got for pri um, like prime minister over there right now, like you really think he's in control of anything? <laughs> uh, look, no, it, that, that, it doesn't make any difference. Um, you, you could lobby and lobby and lobby to change policy, but you know, a policy, even if you were successful, all it could do is one limited linear intervention, like put some goddamn solar panels in the Sahara. You know what I mean? It's not how things go that goes too slow it's too big it's too stupid and and basically you don't understand you can't possibly understand the machinations of that ecosystem i don't even think the people who are actually running that understand it you know i think they're making it up as they go along you know all these big asset management funds all those kinds of things you know it's like ah forget about it you don't have, to have theories about how all that's working like i said come into your place time and your relations where you are. That's that's where the change is. And even if it's about waiting things out and retaining some memory of being a human being, when you create those relationships in time and place, then your bioregion will move you towards what your governance patterns are. They'll move you towards what your trade patterns are. In your networks of relationships, what you'll be is establishing is the is is the the blueprint of an infrastructure of a, a more localized and regional food food chain, uh, sorry, food uh, supply chain. You know what I mean? That infrastructure will be there. If you do that work first and enough people are doing it, then you'll have something that, that can actually be activated within six months of a disaster, such as the satellites dropping out of the sky because China decides to do that, you know, <laughs> or, you know, a massive EMP from the sun that happens like every 180 years or so, and we're overdue now, you know, there's a million things that could happen to completely shut the lights off, uh, to completely destroy. And we, we understand with COVID now how fragile the supply chains are. Uh, these massive global supply chains that are clunky and like cost a million dollars to get mm. one apple to you. <laughs> and it's all just basically subsidized so they got something to burn their fucking oil for. You know, it's like, all right, they, they can keep doing that. I'm going to make these relationships here. And what you've got then is that when you have disruptions like this, you know, instead of sitting there and suffering and eating powdered egg with your granny, 
then you're out there in those networks of relations and you're seeing a blueprint for a local supply chain. You're also seeing the blueprint for a sharing economy. And that's what kicks in because that blueprint isn't just out there. Maybe it's in you as well, patterned in your uh, cellular memory on how to behave as a member of our species in a habitat, you know, and it's quite wonderful and it's quite complex and there's nothing primitive about it. No. And I think you've got, I mean, not only have you got that idea of context and place in the book a lot, you've also mm. got the idea of myth and ritual around that. Can you tie yeah. those two things together? I mean, you talk about each, each, cha- each chapter, you talk about going through a woodworking saga of making the shield or making yeah. the sticks. You also talk about the song lines, you know, which and the ritual of mm. doing different things. Yeah, try and try but and connect a, those. Let's just pick one tiny thread of that. I mean, all these things are psychotechnologies in the same way that yoga is, you know. Um, um, but these were like where where yoga is a psychotechnology that, um, you know, brings you into a way of being able to be human and healthy and, and at peak performance state as if you were still living a hunting, hunter-gatherer lifestyle while you're in a sedentary, a sedentary um, civilization. Well, you know, these, uh, these psychotechnologies, the ritual uh, aspects of indigenous cultures, you know, these are also designed to bring you into place and bring you into relation, uh, into an ancestral relation, but also with all your descendants. So a kind of a timeless state of mind where you're under, understanding yourself as part of a continuum. And so you understand yourself not to be too special. Uh, it's where you cement your close bonds and your dense kin relations all around you. Because when you've got 50 people all standing around going, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's something that happens there. And, and it feels like magic, you know, where you become one mind, but you're still distinct. You know, there's something that's in this in between space. And that's a psychotechnology that puts you somewhere. And all the dance that you do for that, it gives you a body, everything it needs to do. Um, but all of that, you know, like I say, it's a psychotechnology because basically, um, um, I don't know. So I'm, I'm starting to frown like you are now. No. <laughs> I'm not frowning. I'm listening. And so if I like Wait, start no, to, thinking, well, well, look, hang on. If I start to, this is important. If I start to mirror your facial expressions, and mirror the things that you're doing, you know, I start to do that too. You, um, you know, you start to, there's some part of your brain that recognizes that, oh, this person's like me. Um, I'll do well here. You know, you start to feel a connection from that, you know, um, that is multiplied exponentially when you've got 50 people all performing the same action at the same time. Well, what, know, I gonna say, what I was going to say is to what the power happens, of 10. What happens if you don't, like the people that are around you, or you don't resonate with them. I mean, that's what often what I think about it when you're matter. talking about that. It doesn't right, matter. It doesn't you're matter. in relation you're to like, them. Okay, you have no choice. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I've got a, I've got an uncle. <laughs> you know, um, and his position in the birth order of things. He's supposed to be the one who raises me and teaches me all the knowledge I need to know. Um, but he's a profoundly lazy. And a man who does not see to his uh, responsibilities and obligations. <laughs> and, um, you know, personally, if I was running around in the world as an individual, my opinion would be I don't like him, like at all. I don't like being around him. But in the web of relations that we have, even when it's dysfunctional in that way, he's, um, I'm connected to him and, and, and I love him and he loves me. He just, um, he just couldn't be bothered teaching me anything that he's supposed to, <laughs> you know. And I don't know, but I have done ceremony with him, you know. You know, I've made like the grass skirts with him, you know. And in those times and in those moments, we're connected in a very profound way, right up until the point where he's like, um, you know, he stops me from cutting the grass and goes, boy, go to the store <laughs> and give me some cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but st- it doesn't matter. You can't break those kin bonds. You know, you can't choose your family and all that sort of thing. Mm. But that's part of your reality and, and you're there. Um, yeah. And I think that's hard for a lot of people to take, mm. Mm. you know. And that's, I mean, especially because, you know, in a collective sort of shared, sharing-based economy and culture, 
you know, there is a commons and, and we know that you know, our commons can be ruined by one person who takes more than they should or to gain a competitive advantage over everybody else. So then all of right. a sudden everybody has to do that. Otherwise, right. they lose. And now you talk about the outliers and going towards yeah. them being pulled out by the... And yeah. usually yeah. you end yeah. up with there's only a few people left um, holding that entire system together after everybody yeah. goes silly and then start drinking and all the rest. And and then that and that's like, you know, a, a handful of the grannies, probably your granny with a powdered egg, and me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's um but this is this uh what comes in if you're you know, you're playing too much Grand Theft Auto and watching all the <laughs> Fast and Furious movies. You know, I mean, at least there's a kind of a family ethic coming through there, but it's very hyper individualized still, you know, that, that image of, of the culture that's coming through there. So, I mean, you know, we just do what we can. That, that's actually part of our reality right now. And you have to be grounded in your reality and you have to wait for the moments of disruption um, uh, about, to occur. What about what people uh, say? In the I decline go- of the civilization and you just, you just be. You have to be in the reality and prepare for the reality of a, a thousand year cleanup that's coming. And that that's going to be our culture of transition for like a millennium globally, you know, while we get our shit together again. And that's fine. That, that's how, fine. How long do you, how do you, you don't have to see that as negative. This, this, well, you, yeah, actually, you've spoken about te- technologies and, you know, like how long the mobile phones, the, the precious metals, the, the rare metals and the mobile phones will last and the chips, you know. How, how long do you reckon we got? Well, it, it takes, in evolutionary terms, it takes a, um, it takes the symbioses that I was talking about before. It takes about 800 years for those to emerge uh, from a parasitic relation that develops. So then I, I add about 200 years on there as well, because we're also going to have to have a couple of centuries to figure out how to, um, how to dispose of and how to store all yeah. the uh, radioactive I waste. Mean, well, there's a lot of radioactive waste yeah. and nobody knows how to store it. And, you know, it's we're either going to have to store it or adapt to um, living in a, a, you know, radioactive I- environment. Um, I like you know, that point. Either way, brought- either way, you want to add at least 200 years to the standard 800. I mean, you know, sometimes a, a, a mutation can take root in a human. I mean, I'm talking about the, in the human scale of how long it takes a generation to go and the amount of generations it takes for a mutation to take root across a population, sometimes that can happen in 500 years, you know. But, you know, it's about 800 years, you know, for, for that kind of, uh, you know, the evolutionary mutations to to actually, uh, you know, to be selected for and, and happen in a population, yeah. Your idea is not that we're going to go forward more and more with technology get more and more technological, be flying around with teleporting ourselves. We're actually going to go back to the land again. That's your No, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. There's no backwards and forwards with it. Look, here's the thing. Uh, what do you want? What do you want? Do you want the technology itself or do you want the affordances that that technology offers you? Do you right. want what what the technology can give you or do you want the technology itself because right. a laptop is not a beautiful thing nobody loves their laptop you know i freaking hate this laptop but i love some of the things that i mean i can talk right. to a geezer across the other side of the planet right now and that gives me joy you know what i mean um so there are so basically i guess we just need to find ways to uh, have the same kinds of affordances or meet the same needs, you know, without um, without all the, the horrendous bloody world-breaking stuff, you know. And that's not going backwards. That's going really, really forwards. And you know what? There are a lot, there are a lot of things to carry forward from the old stories and the old ways. There are a lot of the affordances we have right now um, that are achievable through the psychotechnologies of the past, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also through the, the, the hybridized systems that have come out. I mean, if you got rid of uh, sedentary lifestyles and civilizations and built environments completely, um, would that mean you'd abandon yoga? You know, if yoga is a response to that? Like, shit, right. no. You know, yoga is, uh, you know, a, a, a living system and body of knowledge that's growing all the time in response to its environment, in response to every culture it's coming into contact with, 
Like, holy shit, you keep that. That's got real evolutionary fitness. You know, you keep it and allow it to continue being emergent and you work it in with things and you allow it to shift and change. And it will change according to, you know, the changing lifestyles and, and places where it, uh, where people are using it. And, and that's beautiful. I don't know. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, you've got negative about this. Yeah. You've got non indigenous species coming into, to your traditional lands and you're making songs up and, you know, you're incorporating them in the body of knowledge, right? Yeah. That's it. And, um, it, you know, it's all good. Um, you know, this, these are just places we're going, you know, but it is important if we, if we still, if we remain, I, f- I fear sometimes that if we remain for another couple of decades, the sort of feedlot pigs that we are, then, you know, we run the risk of, um, I don't know, uh, going past a point of return, you know, to the affordances that we have as a, as a unique and, and, and amazing species the affordances that we have just in our minds and bodies and, and patterns of relating, of, of relationship, you know, patterns of being in place. Um, we run the risk, I don't know, we run the risk of not being able to recover that in time um, as sort of, you know, this civilization inevitably um, winds to its close. Well, and then what happens? If we don't and then what happens? Yeah, if we don't recover it in time. Well, everyone's going um, to want. Well, that's everyone's just all going to um, want to know that. Yeah, yeah well, you missed out the punchline. Well, <laughs> you, well, you know, you know what happens to every species that that fails to that stagnates, and um, you know, over specializes into one sort of niche environment of of you know temporary abundance. You know what happens to those species? They just they just just they just go away. What ought our role to be then on the planet? Because you talk about custodial. Species often people have the they have the idea that we should put ourselves as well you know lesser than the the environment even you know uh, but you know that it's some kind of hubris to to assume that we have uh, a sense you know but do we have responsibility you know, are, are no, we we do right oh look brother your land misses you your land needs you and it's sick without you you know you're a keystone species in your landscape and you've been removed from it because of a system of uh, real estate and land as capital. You know, these things must be made limitable, like I said before, and excludable in order to have value. So most of us are living on only 1% of the land surface, you know, and that land needs us. <laughs> that land needs us in it and caring human, for it. Human being. We occupy, yeah, we occupy a unique ecological niche and a necessary niche for this very long eon that we're living in. Um, you know, and we're a young species. We're only a couple of million years old. That's nothing. You know, we have we have more things to do in our story yet before we move on to being the next thing. You know, and we have an ecological niche, and we need to return to it. You know, we need to return to it. So that's where you put your awareness. Like, yes, do the breathing. That's cool too. But um, notice your time, place, and and your relations. All right, mate. Well, I hope I can call you mate now. And um, yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure. That's, um, what what got, last thing then? Knowing just in a set, like a passing shot, what what can people take away from this? What can they do? What's the first thing you would say? Go do that. Um. Yeah. Well, you I, I you mentioned you mentioned doing your meditation, your thinking, and sitting on uh, finding yeah. water and sitting on a water whale. So you got it. Can they do that? Yeah. Is it easy to find a waterway yeah, in your own city? Yeah, but there's all, there's all, there's all, exactly. I mean, you can find these things, but it's through more of a karma yoga process. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you're doing, you're doing and walking. And, you know, that's um like in, in terms of, in an evolutionary way, you know, walking, thinking, talking, processing, th- these are things that happen with your legs moving as an upright, you know, species that, that walks. We're supposed to be mobile. You know, it's it's on those long walks, you know, where you're extremely mindful of what you're doing and where you are. Um, and you're doing lots of bending and stretching. You're going down to pick up rocks and move things and like, oh, we've got to move that snail off the path or it's going to get squashed. You know, you're doing all these kinds of things. You're being intensely aware of your environment and you're going to climb up that tree there on the side of the road, even though everyone's laughing at you because you want to check out that that uh, crow's nest up there. You know, there's there's all these sorts of things going on. Yeah, you do those things and you walk and you feel, 
you will feel through your feet and particularly in your gut, you'll start to feel that presence of, um, of these lines of energy under the, under the concrete. You know, you'll feel the presence and, and start to notice the difference of how it feels when it's water running under there. You know, there used to be a creek and there still is a creek down there and eventually will come to the surface again when all the concrete breaks up and disappears. You know, you'll feel it when you walk across it and make you feel good. You know, you let that energy go through you and it, it does clean you quite well. Um, yeah, these things are in any landscape that you're inhabiting and you can move through it and be that way. And, um, you know, um, it, it, and it's a damn good start. But, you know, don't abandon anything. And don't let go burn any bridges and, and think you're going to be returning to some glorious hyper, hyperborean past because that doesn't exist. That's a myth of the West. Um, right from the inception. Well, not even. It's a myth that the West inherited. You know, the West didn't invent it. And the Enlightenment Age of Reason did a very good job of trying to kill it, um, but with not very much success. <laughs> um, you know, but we'll get there. Okay, mate. Thanks for your time, eh? Um, no worries. I'm going to bother you again at some point. You've got a lot more to say, I know, but yeah, it was a wonderful little tour through some of your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just really um, enjoyed, you know, just basking in your glossal stops. <laughs>